cartoons are like a whole other universe of colors and crazy ideas. But if you really look at them, you'll see that there's some seriously dark things going on. From cat dogs' inexplicable anatomy to a completely messed up food situation happening at the Bikini Bottom. Today, we're going to dive deep into the secrets of animation that you were too naive to see as a kid. Let's be real, the cat dog show is weird. And I have so many questions. Like why do they spend an insane amount of time inside each other's mouths? Or how the heck do they go to the toilet? Well, now that I think of it, maybe we don't really want to know that. But anyway, the one question that really drives me crazy is, where did they come from? If you look at fan forums, they often mention an episode called Cat Dog and the Great Parent Mystery. This was the show's attempt to explain the issue by suggesting that Cat Dog were adopted and raised by a frog father and a Bigfoot mother. But still, who gave birth to them? There's no way to explain who gave birth to Cat Dog because they're two conjoined twins, meaning they had to have the same biological parents. But the two are completely different species. If you skipped your science classes, let me tell you that cats and dogs cannot breathe. So maybe they're the result of some kind of dark lab experiment. We can spot the Simpsons characters from a mile away with their wacky hairdos, bug-eyed looks, and yellow skin. But why yellow? Why not green, blue, or I don't know, polka dotted? The trademark color wasn't just a random choice. Yellow is bold, bright, and memorable. So that was definitely reason number one for the color choice, since the creators wanted the characters to be unmistakably Simpson-y. And they nailed that goal. But there's also a practical reason. Take a closer look at Bart, Lisa, and Maggie and pay attention to how they have no line to differentiate their skin from their hair. So the designers felt that yellow could pass for both hair and skin. I think that's on the borderline between genius and laziness. Scooby-Doo ain't just some regular dog who likes sniffing out clues. He probably has his own out-of-this-world secret. Since hitting the screen back in the late 60s, yep, Scooby-Doo's been around longer than avocado toast. This dog has become a pop culture icon, starring in a ton of series, movies, and spin-offs. One of the most interesting twists came in the 2010 spin-off series named Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, where they revealed that Scooby is actually an Anunnaki. Come on, not an Anunnaki. Oh wait, what the heck is it? If you search the internet, you'll find that the Anunnaki are entities from Mesopotamian mythology believed to determine the fates of human beings. Oh, great. So a dog is in charge of our destiny. No biggie. But according to the show, the Anunnaki are a race of extraterrestrial beings, some of whom love humans, while others want to destroy our planet. Again, no biggie. Now, you're probably wondering how that happened. Well, in the spin-off series, it's revealed that during a cosmic event known as Nibiru, these Anunnaki slipped through the cracks between dimensions to take over the bodies of animals on Earth, since they have no physical form of their own. So guess who's one of those lucky hosts? Yep, Scooby-Doo himself. Our favorite extraterrestrial? Okay then, an extraterrestrial who really digs dog snacks and, hopefully, is on the good side. We all remember the story of Finding Nemo, unless you've got Dory's memory, of course. It's cute and all, but if the creators had stuck to real nature's rules, that animation wouldn't exactly be family-friendly, to say the least. In real life, clownfish, just like Nemo and his parents, are what we call sequential hermaphrodites. This means that they can be born biologically male and change gender to female when necessary to maintain a balanced population in their social groups. In other words, they can change their gender to breed. Now that you know that, let me break down how Finding Nemo would really play out according to the laws of nature. So, Nemo was the only survivor after a barracuda arrived and, bam, devoured his mother and all her precious unhatched eggs. In reality, when Nemo was born, Nemo's dad, Marlin, would only have one option, to become a mother. Let's call her Marlene for illustrative purposes only. The real surprise comes next. As Nemo grows up and becomes an adult fish himself, 
Marlene would have to suggest the unthinkable, that it's time for the two clownfish to have some offspring of their own. Yeah, in the wild, Nemo's dad would become his mom and then his partner. Oh boy. Even the show Hey Arnold isn't safe from obscure fan theories, and one of them basically rewrites the entire origin story of the series. The cartoon fails to give us a convincing explanation for what happened to Arnold's parents, Miles and Stella. I mean, the story about their disappearance is way too vague. They went on a humanitarian mission to San Lorenzo to cure people of a sleeping condition, and then they were never seen again. So one theory suggests that his grandparents, Phil and Gertie, might actually be his real parents. Because they had him at an older age, Arnold was born with a few health problems, like hydrocephalus. That could explain why he has a football head, as Helga never lets us forget. As a result, he was a lonely kid with no friends, so all the characters in the show like Eugene, Harold and Stinky might just be the products of his imagination. If you pay attention, all of them also have oddly shaped heads, so maybe Arnold imagined them that way to feel more like everyone else. This theory could also explain the origin of the character's name, considering there is a form of hydrocephalus called Arnold Chiari Syndrome. All of this is intriguing, no doubt, but fans finally got the closure they were hoping for during Hey Arnold! The Jungle Movie back in 2017. The story wrapped up this series' biggest mystery by revealing that Arnold's parents were actually alive all along. During that humanitarian mission I mentioned earlier, his parents got that sleeping condition, which basically left them in a long-term coma. I guess it's a happy ending, but it's still pretty dark. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? SpongeBob SquarePants You've probably sung that lyric a million times without ever wondering why he lives in a pineapple. Well, the explanation is pretty simple. The main inspiration for the world of SpongeBob SquarePants is Polynesian culture, and pineapples are a big part of their patterns. But what about Squidward Tentacles House? Its exterior styling resembles one of those Easter Island heads, but in a revamped style with a door where the mouth should be. In real life, people discovered that these sculptures in Chile have torsos hidden beneath the ground. It means that Squidward Tentacles House might also have a huge body hidden underground. But how one of those huge heads ended up under the sea, Crab Trap? Yep, you heard me right. And with rumors swirling about the secret formula for Krabby Patties containing who knows what, let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Krabs is serving up more than just imitation crab meat. So, is he a cannibal? Well, the jury's still out on that one. But one thing's for sure. There's more to Bikini Bottom than meets the eye. I mean, is that what we think it is? If someone finally invents time travel and you hop on a trip to the past, you won't recognize many of the things you know and love today. The Statue of Liberty and the Egyptian pyramids, some basic gadgets like the remote control and your laptop, and even the corn you have for lunch have all changed beyond recognition. When the pyramids were originally built in ancient Egypt and Giza and other places, they didn't look sandy brown at all. All of them were covered with white limestone. If you had seen them under the hot African sun, you'd have to look away. That's how smooth and shiny they were. Builders used around 6 million tons of this material for the Great Pyramid of Giza alone. It's the largest one you can still see on your trip to Egypt. The local rules were quite a thrifty crowd, and they reused some of the casing stones for other construction projects. A massive earthquake in the 14th century has also loosened some of the stones, so you won't see a lot of limestone, but some of it is still there, on top of the Pyramid of Hafre in Giza. It looks like it has a second peak on top of the first. In ancient times, all pyramids used to have capstones called Pyramidians, covered in a mix of gold and silver. Most of them have been lost over the centuries, but you can still see a few of them at museums. They show images of Egyptian deities. The pyramids were probably modeled after a sacred pointed stone, the Benben. It represented the rays of the sun. Now, lifting heavy rocks wasn't so simple without the tech we have today. I guess you'll agree with me if you helped your friends move at least once, and they made you carry the couch. 
But those smart Egyptians of the past thought of that and chose the pyramid shape. It lets the weight distribute evenly throughout the whole thing. The Statue of Liberty has also had a major makeover since it was first unveiled in 1886. Believe it or not, it used to be a shiny brown color, just like a penny. 20 years later, it changed its color to green. It wasn't a fashion statement, but a chemical reaction. The statue is covered with hundreds of thin copper sheets. When copper reacts with air, it naturally forms a protective layer called vudigris. This layer protects what's under it from corrosion, and that's why statues and other things made of copper, brass, and bronze can last so long. When Lady Liberty first turned green, people in authority decided it would be a good idea to paint it all over. It was way before social media, so you couldn't just drop an angry comment under the post describing the idea. But they wrote about it in the local newspapers, and the public didn't love the idea. Then, the Times interviewed a copper and bronze manufacturer, and he confirmed they shouldn't repaint it, because removing the protective layer would mean destroying the statue. Over the years, people have suggested painting Lady Liberty several times, but no one has ever done it. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine that lady in any other color, so I guess it's for the better. You love bananas as much as I do? Next time you enjoy a juicy soft one, remember you gotta thank Selective Breeding for that texture. The original wild bananas had many large hard seeds and not so much delicious pulp. And hey, who doesn't like a sugary watermelon? It has a history of over 5,000 years, and it used to have bitter yellowish white flesh and was really tricky to open. Selective Breeding saved the day again and watermelons got way sweeter. Japanese scientists went further and invented the seedless version. Corn's grandmother is a Mexican grass called teosinti. The kernels in this grass were small and hard to get. Farmers from many thousands of years ago saved the seeds only of those plants that were larger or tastier or with kernels that were easier to grind. Thanks, my friends, for giving us the corn that's edible and even delicious. And just imagine, wild avocados were so small that they could easily fit in the palm of your hand. The pit in them was so large you wouldn't find much edible material inside. They also had a much harder shell than the ones we're used to. You probably wouldn't get a lot of work done without your beloved computer today, but I can't tell you exactly whom to thank for this invention. The ABC from 1942 is one of the contendants for the title of the first computer. It's short for the Atanasoff Berry Computer, named after its inventors at Iowa State University. The ABC weighed over 700 pounds. Yep, yours must be way lighter than that. That big boy consisted of around 300 vacuum tubes and had a rotating drum, a little bigger than a paint can, and had small capacitors on it. A capacitor is a gadget that can store an electric charge, like a battery. The ABC could solve problems with up to 29 different variables to help scientists save some time. Like modern computers, it used binary digits, ones and zeros, to represent all numbers and data. Because of that, it was possible to do the calculations electronically. And now, my favorite part. The ABC finished one operation about every 15 seconds. Just for you to compare, it's millions of operations per second now. Unlike the tech we use today, the ABC did not have a changeable stored program. So the program could only do a single task at a time. An operator had to write down the intermediate answer and then dial that back into the computer. Sounds like another reason to be happy we live in the 21st century. That remote control you use for all sorts of appliances has gone a long way too. Nikola Tesla, who gave us alternating current, designed one of the first wireless remote controls back in 1898. He named his invention Teleautomation and demonstrated it on a miniature boat controlled by radio waves. The boat had a little metal antenna attached to it. 
Tesla sent signals to the boat using a box with a lever and a telegraph key, which was his version of a remote control. Those signals set electrical contacts on the boat into motion and moved the rudder and the propeller, and Tesla was controlling the boat. The concept of the remote control soon spread to other gadgets. The first television remote control followed in 1950. It was designed by the Zenith Radio Corporation called Lazy Bone. Don't take it personally, please. This Lazy Bone had a massive cable that was attached to the TV set, and those who tried it didn't fall in love with the invention because they tripped over that cord. I feel your pain, my friends. If you live or work on one of the top floors, you gotta love this one. Meet the first passenger elevator. It traveled at the speed of 40 feet per minute. Not the fastest, I know, compared to today's record, which is 40 feet per second. But hey, it was built back in 1857 in New York and was more of a tourist attraction than a necessity. The elevator had a steam engine hidden in the basement of a five-story building. Three years later, they shut it down because the public didn't appreciate it. Otis Tufts filed the first patent for a vertical railway around the same time. His invention included an actual car with a bench inside for people to sit on. Sounds like a great spot to hang out with friends to me. What do you say? Then they started adding elevators to luxurious hotels around the world. They were entire rooms with a rich design, upholstered seats and mirrors on the walls, and sometimes even a small chandelier. There was an obligatory operator who'd close the door and the car would start its super slow ascent. It was still more about style than about speed, so I guess I'd choose the stairs. Strange and amazing items are discovered often, but figuring out what our ancestors were up to is pretty tough. Especially when all you have are just some rusty cups and cave drawings. It's no surprise that even the experts in lab coats sometimes make mistakes. But it's not just about dusty plates and huge stones. Sometimes there's even humans with large heads. So grab your digging tools and let's travel back to ancient times to explore incredible societies that even scientists can't fully explain. Sardinia may look idyllic now, but I'm not gonna lie. I wouldn't fancy visiting it 3,000 years ago. Rumor has it, terrible giants roamed around this island back then. People even talk about finding human skeletons over 13 feet tall there, although nobody's ever shown anything to prove it. But the stories will make you wonder because some weird stuff has definitely happened. In 1974, over 5,000 pieces of broken stone artifacts were found in a part of the island called Monte Prama, but instead of being displayed in a museum, they were locked up in an underground vault for about 30 years. Sounds a bit suspicious, doesn't it? When they were finally displaced in 2005, scientists put the pieces together to find statues of 38 giant men standing 8 feet tall. Not quite as tall as the legendary skeletons, but still pretty huge. It's thought these statues were made by the Nuragic people, who lived on the island a long time ago. Besides giant statues, they also built over 8,000 massive stone buildings. Perhaps Nuragic weren't giants themselves, but they definitely liked their things big. I do too. I like a big number of likes on our videos, that would be pretty great. Thank you if you liked this and subscribed. Now back to the video. You and I are pretty smart, but we might not be the smartest humans ever. Actually, we might not even be the smartest species. Since 1913, some skull fossils found in South Africa have hinted at a possibly smarter contender called Boscot Man. This human-like species might have lived as recently as 10,000 years ago. Their skull suggests they had really big heads, which means their brains could have been 30% bigger than ours. Wow! Their average IQ could have been around 149, making them among the smartest 0.05% of people today. But if a Boscot Brainiac was so much smarter, why are they not around and we are? Well, bigger isn't always better, you know. Our brains are a lot bigger than our ape relatives, mainly in the prefrontal cortex. This part helps with high-level tasks like making decisions, remembering things short-term, and being aware of ourselves. 
the parts of the brain that handle our senses and movements haven't really grown much. So, maybe the boss cop spent too much time dwelling on the past rather than doing practical things like hunting. But this is all just guessing. We really don't know what happened to these clever cousins of ours. Some people even argue that boss cops weren't any different from us, with the only evidence being parts of skulls. The jungle is huge. Did you know the Amazon rainforest is home to about 30% of all the world's plant and animal species? That's impressive. However, the history of one native species, humans, has long puzzled scientists. The mysterious Kasarabe people lived here for hundreds of years and then vanished around 1400 AD. People thought the Amazon only had a few scattered tribes, but recently we discovered big, unusual shapes in the ground called geoglyphs. These might look like simple shallow ditches, but they're actually the remains of a vast civilization that spread over 5,000 square miles and includes about 450 markings, some as wide as 1,300 feet. That's insane! They likely contained ceremonial buildings and could have hosted up to a million people as recently as 550 years ago. Thanks to new technology like LiDAR, which uses a safe laser to map the forest without harming it, we can explore deeper. In 2019, some scans showed miles of raised roads and pathways and even pyramids over 70 feet tall. They found 26 separate settlements two of which were at least 250 acres each. Damn, that's like 330 soccer fields. It's not certain what happened to the Kasarabi people. Maybe European conquistadors drove them out. Maybe the most baffling ancient civilization is one we've never actually found a trace of. Yep, I'm talking about Atlantis, the grand city that supposedly sank into the ocean. The first mentions of Atlantis come from the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who talked about a great city near the Strait of Gibraltar. But for ages, everyone just thought Plato made up Atlantis as a perfect version of his own Athens. So why, about 12,000 years after it supposedly vanished, do we still wonder if it might be real? Well, in the 19th century, U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly wrote a book giving 13 reasons why he thought Atlantis was more than just a myth. Then, in 1965, some folks thought they actually found Atlantis when they discovered the Richat structure, a massive 25-mile-wide dome in Mauritania, Africa. It's so big that you can see the whole thing from space. Two astronauts flying over the Sahara Desert spotted this giant eye staring back at them and thought they'd made the discovery of a lifetime. Unfortunately, there's no solid evidence linking this structure to Atlantis. It's believed to have formed from volcanic activity about a hundred million years ago. But it does look suspicious, doesn't it? Still, we're no closer to knowing the truth. Imagine going back to about 3,300 BCE and finding yourself in South Asia. Welcome to the Harappan civilization. These people were way ahead of their time. They had cities like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, complete with baked brick houses, sophisticated drainage systems, and even public baths. This place might have had over 5 million people, making it one of the densest regions at the time. They also invented a system of standardized weights that was incredibly useful for traders. And trading they did. These people had connections stretching all the way to the Middle East, thanks to their great skills in metallurgy. They even had a form of ancient branding. The seals were used to stamp clay on tray goods. Despite being so advanced with a thriving urban life, there's a whole bunch of mystery shrouding their language and script. We've got bits and pieces of their writing, but no one's deciphered them yet, even with all the technology we have today. We also still don't know how exactly their society worked. It looks like they didn't flaunt their social status as much as other civilizations. No grand palaces or massive monuments. Instead, their largest buildings might have been granaries. They sure were practical. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Around 1800 BCE, this bustling civilization started to decline, possibly due to shifts in river patterns. As the environment changed, the Harappans packed up, 
moving towards more hospitable lands. Ever heard of the Minotaur? The beast with a bull's head and a man's body, hunting the bravest travelers in a massive maze? Well, this wasn't just any old tale. It was one of the most popular dramas of the ancient world, and it was inspired by this place, the island of Crete. The Minoans lived here during the Bronze Age. They had stunning palaces, amazing frescoes, and a culture so rich it still fascinates historians to this day. They built places like Knossos, which was so complex with its multi-story buildings and elaborate hallways that it might have inspired the whole labyrinth myth. Their engineering was so ahead of its time that even their drainage systems were more advanced than what many of us have today. Let me know in the comments which of these stories you find the most fascinating, and thanks for watching. Many of the world's most famous paintings are hundreds of years old, but even after all this time, Modern technology is helping us discover previously unknown mysteries hidden in masterpieces. What secret does Mona Lisa have to tell us, and what inspired Salvador Dali when he created one of his most famous paintings? Let's find out these and other art secrets together. The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most famous and enigmatic portraits in the world's art history, apparently for a reason. During its restoration, thanks to high-tech scans, experts spotted hidden letters in her eyes. These letters might point at a different identity for the model, but let's start from the beginning. Even though it doesn't prove that the Da Vinci Code is real, there is likely some kind of code hidden both in the eyes of Mona Lisa and in the background of her portrait. Members of Italy's National Committee for Cultural Heritage found out that when you look at the painting under a microscope, the letters L and V are visible in one of Mona Lisa's eyes. There are also other letters in there as well, but they aren't as decipherable as these two. As for the background, once you look really well, you can notice the number 72 on the arch over here. Or perhaps that's the letter L and the number 2. This is still a bit unclear. After all, the painting is more than 500 years old. Scientists are unsure of what all these symbols might mean. LV could potentially stand for Leonardo da Vinci. But then, what about 72? Well, we might never find out. Look at this picture. It's called The Ambassadors, and it was painted by Hans Holbein the Younger. At first glance, there isn't anything special about this picture, just two men of the Tudor court surrounded by musical instruments, globes, and the most high-tech gadgets of that time. They look quite different with their life. But here's the trick. You should keep in mind that the European Renaissance is famous for its love of symbolism. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yep, even though the picture might seem to be a straightforward celebration of wealth and education, the true story behind it is much more sinister. Pay attention to this grey disc in the foreground. It looks like something shapeless and distorted. But when you glance at it from the bottom left corner like this, this elongated object turns into a human skull. We can probably compare it to a VR experience for viewers of those times. This skull played the role of memento mori, a reminder to everyone who saw it that even the wealthiest and the most educated were bound to pass away one day. So you must live your life to the fullest while you can. You've probably seen this surrealistic painting before. Some love it. Others feel creeped out by the weird melting shapes, but it leaves no one indifferent. It's The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali, created in 1931. And the most well-known elements in this painting, the melting clocks, were apparently inspired by the texture of melting camembert cheese. The whole landscape in this picture is weirdly flaccid, especially if we compare it with Salvador Dali's own vertical mustache. The rumor has it that the idea of this painting drooped its way into Dali's mind when he was looking at a plate of soft camembert cheese melting in the sun. But the cheesy timepiece aside, what does the painting even mean? This dream-inspired landscape makes you question how much of what you see is a dream and how much is reality. As you might know, surrealists like to play tricks on their viewers' minds. This technique of painting is known as trompe As for Dali, he worked in a method he created, which is called the Panoroaic Critical Method. Well, yeah, I can definitely see some craziness here. 
The artist induced this feeling by starting with a single object and then responding to it through some kind of irrational subconscious associations. Now look at this famous painting by Peter Bruegel. The official title of this masterpiece is Netherlandish Proverbs. Kinda weird for the painting that seems to be an extremely detailed portrait of a busy Dutch street. But true to the name, there's so much more than that in this picture. Lots of different proverbs are hidden here, let's try to find them all. We'll go clockwise starting from the left. Do you see this globe? It's turned upside down and stands for the proverb, the whole world is upside down. Now let's move on to this man who's running as fast as he can, probably trying to put out the fire raging on his behind. That's the saying, run like your backside is on fire. Over here, a man is warming himself at a house fire. This symbolizes not caring who's hurt as long as it benefits you. It's like roasting marshmallows at a house fire. Now these three figures in the back standing in the line, they represent the proverb, the blind leads the blind. This kind of situation happens when someone who knows nothing gets advice or help from a person who also knows nothing about the issue. Here you can see a fish eating another fish. The saying, there's always a bigger fish, is concealed here. This man holding a globe has actually got the world in the palm of his hand. The man in armor with a knife in his mouth behaves weirdly because he symbolizes the proverb armed to his teeth. And this man is hitting his head against the wall. Quite a useless occupation, I'd say. Have you spotted any other proverbs in this picture? Share your finds in the comments. The next picture and another secret. A recent discovery has revealed the mystery behind this crowd of people. They seem to be looking at something, but what? There's nothing here on this empty beach. But how about this? When the painting Scheveningen Sands was created in the 1600s, it depicted a group of beachgoers gathered around a beached whale. But somewhere along the way, the animal was painted over. This left the group standing around for no apparent reason. Experts restored the painting at the Fitzwilliam Museum and discovered something that looked like a person floating in the air. But in reality, it was the fin of a beached whale. Why was it painted over? According to the restorer who worked on the painting, the depiction of unalive animals in pictures was considered offensive in the 18th to early 19th centuries. That's when the whale was probably hidden. Michelangelo's David is one of the most well-known statues in the world. There are 30 life-size replicas of David all over the globe, but if you think you know this masterpiece well enough, get ready for a surprise. Depending on the angle at which you view David, you can see two totally different stories. You see, it's possible that Michelangelo never thought that people would be able to see the statue's face head on. So when you look at it from below, as most people do, David seems to have a calm expression on his face. But when you look at him face to face, his expression morphs into that of fear or perhaps even anger. One paper even claims that Michelangelo left other clues to David's anguished state. The veins in his arms are popping out and his brow is furrowed. Michelangelo drew inspiration for this masterpiece from the story of David, the tale of a young shepherd boy who protected people by getting rid of a giant named Goliath by wielding only a sling and a handful of stones. But even though this classic stars a feeble boy, the great artist David is considered to be a pinnacle of male perfection. The statue weighs nearly 12,500 pounds and is a staggering 17 feet high. That's as tall as a two-story building or a grown-up giraffe. The size of the statue is not the result of artistic ego, but of simple logistics. Originally, the statue was to be placed in a ceiling niche of the Florence Cathedral, so it had to be large enough to be seen from below. Public toilets can be absolutely disgusting, and it's sort of frustrating when you pay for it but can't really use it because of the mess inside. But now there are completely transparent toilet cubicles, and you can actually see if the toilet is good to be used before spending money on it. This innovation comes straight from Japan, but worry not, these toilets won't deprive you of your well-deserved privacy. These new see-through toilets are made with special colored glass that turns opaque when in use. Bonus here, at night, these public toilets can serve as beautiful park lanterns, thanks to multicolored lights. 
Geese are now hired by some police departments in China. The police in one province in China found a new way to keep police stations secure overnight. Instead of using dogs, they've turned to geese. Several years ago, there was reportedly this break-in at a police station, but guard geese saved the day. They spotted the intruder and alerted the police officers before he could steal a confiscated motorbike. Experts think geese make great protectors because they have super sharp senses and are always on high alert. See, geese have hearing and vision, so they can spot trouble from far away. They're also very territorial, which makes them perfect for guarding places like police stations or chicken coops. Unlike dogs who can be bribed with treats, geese stay focused once they start honking. They can be a handful to calm down, but they're pretty low maintenance otherwise. Just feed them cracked corn and grass and they're good to go. So they can be bribed with treats. Residents in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city, were being asked by city officials to flush their toilets at the same time to help with sewer blockages caused by water rationing. The city council wanted residents to flush at 7.30 p.m. when the water was back on. That synchronized flushing was needed to clear up built-up waste. The first synchronized flushing was successful, but some residents doubted its effectiveness. Despite this, the city planned to continue with the initiative twice a week. City officials hoped this coordinated effort would address sewer issues and minimize damage to the city's infrastructure, even though some residents were skeptical. I bet this tore the fabric of space and time, though, somewhere in the universe. Those who have no one to leave their cat with while on vacay, the solution for you was invented back in the 1970s. Meet Gary Dahl, a guy who created a perfect pet that doesn't need food and an expensive vet checkup. His innovative idea got the name, the Pet Rock. Yep, he suggested keeping pebbles as pets. And guess what? This crazy idea made him a millionaire overnight. It all started as a joke among friends, but Dahl turned it into a viral sensation by packaging it with care and creating a playful backstory. The Pet Rock became a popular holiday gift in 1975, selling about 1.5 million items at about $4 each. Keep in mind that $4 were valued more almost 50 years ago. The craze faded over time, but the Pet Rock's impact on pop culture and the toy industry remains. However, the trend seems to have returned, as there's a new trend in South Korea. Young people there domesticate stones, paint faces on them, and even give them names. I guess there'll always be people who have more money than they do brains. In a small village tucked away in the Italian Alps, Winter has gotten a whole lot brighter thanks to a giant mirror perched on a nearby mountain. This mirror, standing tall at 16 feet high and 26 feet wide, has been strategically positioned to bounce the sun's rays right into the village's main square. Before this nifty idea, Viganella, home to just under 200 people, was plunged into darkness from the 11th of November to the 2nd of February every year, all thanks to the valley's steep sides. So, the mayor decided to shake things up and forked out around 100,000 euros for this genius mirror. Needless to say, the whole village is over the moon about it. No more being cooped up indoors during the winter chill now. The residents can soak up the sun's warmth in the historic piazza, especially the older folks who are really feeling the gloom. Real vanilla flavoring in cookies or ice cream can be replaced with a secretion extracted from beaver behinds. Every now and then, you might see posts on social media warning folks about a substance called castoreum that could be lurking under the natural flavoring label in some sweets. It's true, beavers do produce a sweet-smelling edible substance called castoreum from their glands near their bums. But don't worry too much about finding it at your local store. Experts say it's pretty rare and expensive. Castoreum is a yellowish-brown goo in beavers' scent glands near their tails. They use it to mark their territory, leaving a scent that humans can easily smell. Even though castoreum has been used for centuries in medicine and perfumes, it's not as common in foods these days. Cheaper synthetic alternatives like vanillin are now preferred. While the FDA says this substance is safe to eat, the chances of accidentally munching on the beaver butt goo are pretty slim because there's not really a big supply of it for food use. Imagine being the first guy that looked at a beaver bum and thought, I bet we could get something sweet from there. Isn't it wonderful to have a refreshing walk after a rainfall? Streets appear shiny, the air feels nicer, and people are typically happier to have the sun shining again. The only downside is dealing with damp benches and chairs. 
Luckily, innovative designers, particularly from Korea, have devised a clever solution. These benches have slats that can be rotated to the dry side by turning a handle. No more wet pants situations and awkward moments during dates. In LA, some reservoirs have weird-looking black plastic balls that cover the water. These shade balls aren't just for looks, they're part of a huge $34 million project to protect the water supply from pollution and evaporation. By filling the balls with water and releasing millions of them into the reservoirs, the city hopes to save around $250 million compared to other ideas. The idea of using shade balls came from a former biologist at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. They got the inspiration from similar balls used to keep birds away from airport drainage ponds. These black balls only cost 36 cents each to make, and now they're floating on water in four reservoirs around LA, with 96 million in the LA reservoir alone. The balls are black because they have carbon in them, which helps soak up UV rays. This stops sunlight from getting through the plastic and onto the water. Experts say a lighter color wouldn't work as well. Using carbon in outdoor stuff is pretty common because it helps materials deal with being in the sun all day. Route 66 is a well-known and beloved piece of American history, attracting tourists from all over the world. But did you know that there was once a road that could actually sing? There was a section in New Mexico known as the Singing Road, or the Musical Road. This unique feature played the song America the Beautiful when vehicles drove over rumble strips embedded in the road. Drivers needed to maintain a speed of 45 miles per hour to hear the melody, promoting focus and reducing distractions. While driving over rumble strips for an extended period may not be ideal for tire maintenance, the Singing Road in New Mexico provided a fun and entertaining experience for travelers. The road doesn't sing anymore though, but if you want to have such an experience, there are other musical roads out there. Similar ones can be found in various countries worldwide, including Denmark, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, and San Marino. Artist Allison Schatz has made some cool picket fences out of mirrors that make you think about why we have barriers and make you ponder life. She's been putting these trippy installations in all kinds of places since 2003. The fences reflect the world around them and turn it into something smooth or wacky, depending on where they are. It's easy to imagine neighborhoods feeling more open and friendly with these artsy fences around. But we should probably think about how these new environments might affect the safety of kids, pets, and birds. <laughs>